Hi everyone, and welcome back to Goodnight Stars. Tonight we are reading the fourth and final section of The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen, which was the inspiration behind the movie Frozen, even though the story is a little different. So the fourth section starts with what is called the fifth story, The Little Robber Girl. They drove through the dark forest, but the coach shone like a torch. It dazzled the robbers and that they couldn't stomach. It's gold, it's gold, they shouted, rushed forwards, seized the horses, killed the small jockeys, the coachman and the servants, then pulled little Gerda out of the carriage. She's plump, she's fine, she's fattened with nut kernels, said the old robber woman, who had long wiry whiskers and eyebrows that hung down over her eyes. She's as good as a little fattened lamb. Oh, how delicious she'll taste. And she drew out her shiny knife and it gleamed in a horrible way. Ow, the woman cried suddenly. She had been bitten in the ear by her own little daughter who hung on her back and was so wild and unkempt it was a joy to see. You nasty little brat, her mother said and forgot about Gerda. She's to play with me, the little robber girl said. She's to give me her muff, her beautiful dress, sleep with me in my bed. And she bit her mother again. So the robber woman leapt into the air and turned round and all the robbers laughed and said, see how she dances with her young brat. I want to go inside the coach, the little robber girl said, and simply to, and simply to have her will for she was so spoiled and stubborn. She and Gerda sat down in it, and then they drove over tree stumps and thorn bushes deeper into the forest. The little robber girl was as big as Gerda, but stronger, more broad-shouldered and dark-skinned. Her eyes were quite black, so they almost looked sad. She took Gerda by the waist and said, they're not going to kill you as long as I don't get angry with you. Are you really a princess? No. Gerda said, and she told her everything she had experienced and how fond she was of little Kay. The robber girl looked at her very seriously, nodded slightly and said, they're not going to kill you. And if I nevertheless should happen to get angry with you, I'd rather do it myself. And then she dried Gerda's eyes and stuffed both her hands into the lovely muff, which was so soft and so warm. Now the coach came to a stop. There in the middle of the courtyard of a robber's castle, there were great cat cracks in it from top to bottom. Ravens and crows flew out of the open holes and the huge fierce dogs, each of them looked as if it could swallow a whole human being, leapt high into the air, but they didn't bark for that was forbidden. In the large old sooty hall, a large fire was burning in the middle of the stone floor. Smoke gathered up under the roof and had to find its own way out. A large cauldron of soup was stewing and both hares and rabbits were being turned on a spit. You're to sleep with me here along with all my small animals, the robber girl said. They were given food and drink and then they went over into a corner where straw blankets lay. Above them on laths and perches, sat almost a hundred pigeons, all of which seemed to be asleep, although they turned slightly when the girls came. They are all mine, the little robber girl said, and swiftly grabbed one of the closest, held it by its legs and shook it so that it flapped its wings. Kiss it, she cried out and slapped Gerda in the face with it. There the forest rascals are sitting, she continued, and further back showed a host of bars that had been fixed in front of a hole high up in the wall. They're forest rascals, those two. They'll fly off at once if one doesn't have them securely behind bars. And here's my dear old Pooh. She pulled out by the reindeer antlers that had shiny copper ring round its neck and was bound. We also have him tied up, otherwise he too would run away from us. Every single evening I tickle his throat with my sharp knife. He's so afraid of that. And little girl pulled out a long knife out of a cleft in the wall and let it glide over the reindeer's neck. The poor animal kicked out with its legs and the robber girl laughed and pulled Gerda down with her onto the bed. Aren't you going to have a knife with you when you sleep? Gerda said and rather gave a scared look. I always sleep with a knife, the little robber girl said. 
you never know what might happen. But say again what you told me about little Kay and why you set out into the great wide world. And Gerda told her from the beginning, and the pigeons cooed up there in their cage. The other pigeons slept. The little robber girl placed her arm round Gerda's neck, held the knife in the other hand, and fell noisily asleep. But Gerda simply couldn't close her eyes. She didn't know if she was going to live or die. The robbers were sitting round the fire, singing and drinking, and the old robber woman was doing somersaults. It was quite terrible for a little girl to watch. Then the wood pigeon said, Coo, coo, we've seen little Kay. A white hen bore his sledge. He sat in the Snow Queen's carriage, which streamed down low above the forest where we lay in our nest. She blew on us young birds and all of them died except for the two of us. Coo, coo. What are you saying up there? Gerda called out. Where was the Snow Queen heading? Do you know anything about that? She's sure to have been on her way to Lapland, for there's always snow and ice there. Just ask the reindeer who's bound on the rope. There's ice and snow there. It's wonderful and marvelous there, the reindeer said. There you can run around freely in the vast gleaming valleys. There the Snow Queen has her summer tent, but her permanent palace is up near the North Pole, on the island they call Spitsbergen. Oh, Kay, little Kay, Gerda sighed. Lie still now, the robber girl said. Otherwise, I'll stick my knife in your stomach. In the morning, Gerda told her everything the wood pigeons had said, and the little robber girl looked quite serious, but nodded and said, It's all the same. It's all the same. Do you know where Lapland is? She asked the reindeer. Who could know better than I can? The animal said and rolled its eyes in its head. That is where I was born and bred where I've cavorted on the fields of snow. Listen, the robber girl said to Gerda, you can see that all our men are away at the moment, but the old woman's still here and she stays put, but during the morning she drinks out of her big bottle and then takes a nap. Now I'm gonna do something for you. She leapt out of bed, went over to her mother's neck, pulled her by the whiskers and said, good morning, my fine little nanny goat and her mother flicked her under the nose so it turned red and blue, but it was all out of pure affection. And when her mother had drunk from her bottle and was taking a nap, the little robber girl went over to the reindeer and said, I really have this peculiar urge to tickle you many more times with the sharp knife, for you are such fun then, but no matter, I will loosen your rope and help you outside so you can run off to Lapland but you must go as fast as ever you can and take this little girl for me to the Snow Queen's palace where her playmate is. You've heard what she told me for she spoke loudly enough and you were eavesdropping. The reindeer leapt into the air with joy. The robber girl lifted little Gerda up and took the precaution of binding her, even of giving her a cushion to sit down. It's all the same, she said. Here are your fuzzy boots for it'll be cold, but I'll keep them off myself. It's too delightful, but I won't let you freeze even so. Here are my mother's big mittens. They'll reach right up to your elbows. Stick your hands in. Now your hands look just like those of my hideous mother. And Gerda cried with joy. I can't stand you blubbering like that, the robber girl said. You should be looking very pleased instead right now. And here are two loaves and a ham for you so you won't go hungry. Both were fixed behind her on the reindeer. The little robber girl opened the door, enticed all the big dogs inside, and then she cut the rope and said to the reindeer, off you run, but take good care of the little girl. And Gerda stretched out her hands with large mittens on out towards the robber girl and said goodbye. And the reindeer shot over shrubs and tree stumps through the great forest over bogs and steps as fast as it could. The wolves howled and the ravens cawed, whoosh, whoosh, it said up in the sky. It was as if it sneezed red. Those are my old northern lights, the reindeer said. Just look at how they gleam. And it shot off even faster, night and day. The loaves were eaten, the ham too, and then they were in Lapland. Sixth story, the Lap woman and the Finnmark woman. 
They stopped at a quiet house. It was so pitiful. The roof went right down to the ground and the door was so low that the family had to creep on their stomachs when they wanted to go in or out. There was no one at home except an old lap woman who was frying fish in the light of a train oil lamp. And the reindeer told her Gerda's entire story, but first its own, for it felt that it was much more important. And Gerda was so perishing with cold that she couldn't speak. Oh, you poor things, the lap woman said. In that case, you still have a long way to go. You have to cover 600 miles or so into Finnmark, for there the Snow Queen is out in the country, burning blue lights every single evening. I'll write a few words on some split cod. I haven't any paper. I'll give it to you for the Finnmark woman up there. She can give you better directions than I can. And when Gerda had been warmed up and had something to eat and drink, the lap woman wrote a few words on some split cod, told Gerda to take good care of it, bound her to the reindeer once more, and off it leapt. Whoosh, whoosh, it said up in the sky. All night long, the loveliest blue northern lights gleamed. And then they came to Finnmark and knocked on the chimney of the Finnmark woman, for she didn't even have a door. It was so hot inside that the Finnmark woman went around practically naked. She was tiny and her complexion muddy. She immediately loosened little Gerda's clothes, took off her mittens and boots, for otherwise she would have been too hot, placed a piece of ice on the reindeer's head, and then read what had been written on the split cod. She read it three times, and by then she knew it by heart, and then she put the fish in the cooking pot, for she never wasted anything. First the reindeer told its story, then little Gerda's, and the Finnmark woman blinked her wise eyes, but didn't say anything. You are so wise, the reindeer said. I know you can tie up all the winds in the world on a piece of sewing thread. If the skipper does undoes one knot, he gets a fair wind. If he does the other, it blows hard. If he does the third and fourth, there is such a gale that the forests blow down. Won't you give a little girl a potion so she can have the strength of 12 men and overpower the Snow Queen? The strength of 12 men, the Finnmark woman said. Yes, that should do the trick. She went over to a shelf took out a large rolled up hide and unrolled it. On it, strange letters were written and the Finnmark woman read away till the sweat poured down her forehead. But the reindeer entreated the woman on Gerda's behalf yet again. And Gerda looked at the Finnmark woman with such imploring, tear-filled eyes that the woman blinked her own once more and drew the reindeer over into a corner. There she whispered to it while giving it a fresh piece of ice on its head. It's true that little Kay is with the Snow Queen and finds everything perfect there and believes it is the best place in the world. But that is because he has got shards of glass in his heart and a small speck of glass in his eye, and they must be removed. Otherwise, he can never become a human being again, and the Snow Queen will retain her power over him. But can't you find something for little Gerda that will give her power over everything? I can't give her greater power than she already has. Can't you see how great that is? Can't you see how humans and animals have to serve her? How she has managed to get so far in the world on her own bare feet? She must not be told of her power by us. It resides in her heart. It exists because she is a sweet, innocent child. If she is unable of her own accord to get to the Snow Queen and remove the glass from little Kay, we cannot help her to do so. A dozen miles from here, the Snow Queen's garden starts. You can carry the little girl up to that point, set her down by the large bush that stands in the snow with its red berries. Don't stand there chatting away and hurry back here. And then the Finnmark woman lifted little Gerda up onto the reindeer who sped off as swiftly as it could. Oh, I've forgotten my boots. I've forgotten my mittens, little Gerda cried out. She could feel this in the biting cold, but the reindeer didn't dare stop. It ran until it came to a large bush with the red berries. There it set Gerda down, kissed her on the lips, and large glistening tears ran down its cheeks. And it ran back as swiftly as it could, back again. There stood poor Gerda without any shoes, without any mittens, in the middle of the frightful cold of Finnmark. She ran forward as fast as she could, and she was met by a whole regiment of snowflakes. But they did not fall from the sky, which was perfectly clear and gleaming with the northern lights. 
the snowflakes followed the ground and the closer they came, the larger they became. Gerda recalled how large and odd they had looked when she had looked at them through the burning glass, but here they were really large and frightening in a completely different way. They were alive. They were the Snow Queen's outposts. They had the strangest shapes. Some looked like large, ugly hedgehogs, and others looked like whole coils of snakes that stuck out on their heads. And yet others looked like small, fat bears with bristling hairs, all of them gleaming white. All of them were live snowflakes. Then little Gerda said her Lord's Prayer, and the cold was so severe that she could see her own breath. It stood out from her mouth like a great cloud of smoke, and her breath became increasingly dense and formed itself into small bright angels that grew larger and larger when they touched the ground, and all of them were wearing helmets on their heads, and they were holding spears and shields in their hands. They grew in number, and when Gerda had finished her Lord's Prayer, there was a whole legion around. They jabbed at the horrible snowflakes with their spears and the snowflakes broke into a hundred pieces and little Gerda was able to move on safe and undaunted. The angels patted her feet and hands so she could feel less how cold they were and walk briskly on towards the Snow Queen's palace. But no, we must first have a look at how Kay is getting on. It is true that he wasn't thinking of little Gerda, least of all that she was standing outside the palace. Seventh story. What happened in the Snow Queen's palace and what happened afterward? The walls of the palace were of whirling snow and its windows and doors of biting winds. There were more than a hundred halls formed as the snow drifted, the largest stretching many miles, all of them lit by the brightest northern lights. And they were so large, so empty, so icy cold, and so gleaming. There was never any form of gaiety here, not even a little bear ball where the gale could blow and polar bears walk out on their hind legs and put on airs and graces. Never a small card party with slaps and blows to the mouth. Never the slightest signs of a coffee party of the young white fox ladies. Everything was empty, large and cold in the halls of the Snow Queen. The Northern lights gleamed so precisely that one could tell when they were turned right up and when they were screwed right down. In the very middle of the empty endless snow hall, there was a frozen lake. It had cracked into a thousand pieces, but each piece resembled the next one completely so that it was nothing less of a feat. And in the middle of it, the Snow Queen sat when at home. And then she said that she sat in the mirror of reason and that this was the only and best thing in the world. Little Kay was quite blue with cold, yes, almost black, but he didn't notice it even so, for remember, she had kissed the shiver of cold off him, and his heart was practically a lump of ice. He was dragging some sharp, flat pieces of ice around with him, which he combined in all sorts of ways, for he wanted to make something out of them. It was just like when we have small slabs of wood and make figures out of them, which we call the Chinese game. Kay was also trying to make figures. The most ingenious of all was the ice game of reason. His eyes, the figures were quite excellent and of utmost importance. It was the speck of glass in his eye that had made him see things like that. He composed whole figures, which were a written word, but he never succeeded in forming the exact word that he wanted, the word eternity. And the Snow Queen had said, if you can make that word for me, you shall be your own master and I will make you a present of the entire world and a pair of new skates. But he was unable to. Now I'm going to swish off to the warm countries, the Snow Queen said. I want to look down into the black cauldrons. These were the fire spewing mountains of Etna and Vesuvius, as they are called. I'm going to whitewash them a bit. That's all part of it. It's good on top of lemons and grapes. And off flew the Snow Queen. And Kay sat all on his own in the many mile long empty ice hall and looked at the pieces of ice and racked his brains till they creaked. He sat there stiff and still. He looked as if he had frozen to death. It was at this moment that little Gerda entered the palace through the great gate made of biting winds. 
but she said an evening prayer, and the winds lay down as if they wanted to sleep, and she entered the large, empty, cold halls. Then she caught sight of Kay, knew him, and threw her arms round his neck, held him tight, and called out, Kay! Dear little Kay! At last I've found you! But he sat there quite still, stiff and cold. Then little Gerda cried hot tears, and they fell on his chest, and they managed to enter his heart. They thawed out the lump of ice and consumed the tiny fragment of mirror inside. He looked at her, and she sang the hymn. The roses are in blossom in the veil. There the Christ child too speaks without fail. Then Kay burst into tears. He wept so hard that the speck from the mirror rolled out of his eyes. He knew her and he cried joyously, Gerda, dear little Gerda, where have you been all this time? And where have I been? And he looked around him. How cold it is here. How empty and huge it is here. And he held on tight to Gerda and she laughed and cried with joy. It was so wonderful that even the pieces of ice danced around with joy. And when they retired and lay down, they formed precisely the combination of letters and the Snow Queen had said he was to try to find them. So now he was his own master and she would have to make a present of him to the entire world and a pair of new skates. And Gerda kissed his cheeks and they started to bloom. She kissed his eyes and they shone like hers. She kissed his hands and feet, and he was strong and healthy. It made no difference if the Snow Queen returned home. His charter of freedom stood written there in the gleaming pieces of ice. And they took each other by the hand and walked out of the large palace. They talked about grandmother and about the roses up on the roof. And wherever they walked, the winds died down and the sun came out. And when they reached the bush with the red berries, the reindeer was standing there waiting for them and it had another young reindeer with a full udder and it gave the young ones its milk and kissed them on the lips. Then they carried Kay and Gerda first to the Finnmark woman where they warmed themselves in her hot living room and were given directions for their home journey. Then on to the Lap woman who had sewn new clothes for them and got her sleigh ready. And the reindeer and the young reindeer ran alongside and followed them right to the border of the country where the first green signs of spring could be seen, where they said goodbye to the reindeer and the lap woman. Goodbye, they all said to each other. And the first small birds started to chirp and the forest had light green buds and out of it on the magnificent horse, which Gerda knew it had been hitched to the gold carriage, came a young girl with a shining red cape on her head, holding pistols in front of her. It was the little robber girl who was bored at being home and wanted to head northwards first and then in a different direction if it didn't please her. She knew Gerda immediately and Gerda knew her and there was great happiness. You're a fine fellow to go traipsing around, she said to little Kay. I wonder if you're worth running to the ends of the world for. But Gerda patted her on the cheek and asked about the prince and princess. They've left for abroad, the robber girl said. But the crow, little Gerda asked, well, the crow's dead, she answered. The tame sweetheart is now a widow and goes around with a small piece of black wool around her leg. She complains so pitifully and it's nonsense, all of it. But tell me how things have gone for you and how you managed to get a hold of him. And both Gerda and Kay told her. And snip, snap, clover, song is over, the robber girl said took them both by the hand and promised that if she ever happened to pass by their city, she would come up and pay them a visit. Then she rode off in the great wide world, but Kay and Gerda walked hand in hand. As they walked along, it was a wonderful spring with flowers and greenness everywhere. The church bells sang and they knew the tall towers, the great city, that was where they lived. And they entered it and went to grandmother's door, up the stairs, into the living room where everything stood just as before. And the clock said, tick tock, and the hands turned round. But as they went through the door, they noticed that they had become adults. 
The roses from the gutter bloomed in the open windows, and there were the small children's stairs, and Kay and Gerda sat down on them and held each other's hands. They had forgotten, like some heavy dream, the cold, empty magnificence of the Snow Queen's palace. Grandmother was sitting in God's bright sunshine and was reading out loud from the Bible. Unless you become as little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And Kay and Gerda looked into each other's eyes and suddenly they understood the old hymn. The roses are in blossom in the veil. There the Christ child too speaks without fail. There they sat, two grown-ups and yet children, children at heart. And it was summer, warm, wonderful summer. This has been a fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen, translated into English by John Irons in 2014. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, good night, stars. <laughs>